time to don some black power armor and xenomortis and purge some xenos, because today we're talking through the new rules and tricks for Codex Death Watch. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So the new Death Watch Codex supplement has dropped, the army now a full supplement for Codex Space Marines, being able to use nearly all of their units and having plenty of tricks of their own. I'd say that this book is interesting, they certainly have some powerful tricks, though they aren't quite the same as they were before. In 8th edition, Death Watch armies tended to lean very heavily into their special issue ammunition, to the extent where it was pretty much the main reason to take certain units out of the faction. I think from this update, Death Watch are going to act a little bit more like a standard Space Marine army, with access to the full arsenal of units and heavy armaments, but still with plenty of their own unique gear and tricks to make the faction feel fairly unique. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the match play rules. I'm afraid we're not going to be covering the Crusade rules here. There are quite a lot of them, and I will get a video done if I have time, depending on how many other books Games Workshop decides to release in the near future. So let's start out with the rules contents then, and we'll go through each section. First of all, we've got some of the Army Core Special Rules, including their Mission Tactics Combat Doctrine and Special Issue Ammunition. They've got a hefty amount of stratagems, I believe 18 in total. Army Rules for Warlord Traits, Relics and the Xenopurge Discipline. A bunch of their unique data sheets, including Kill Team Cassius, Cassius himself and Codician Natorian, all of which were in the Index and then new since the last Codex. They also have some special rules for forming four different Kill Teams, which work a bit differently to previously. Death Watch also have four unique secondary objectives, but they could take on top of Codex Space Marine ones. In all honesty, it's quite a meaty rule section for a £17.50 supplement. Certainly more rules in here than some similar priced Games Workshop publications in the past. Let's start out with Mission Tactics then, which was previewed on Warhammer Community. This one is essentially Death Watch's Super Doctrine. You can only have this if your entire army is Death Watch, though Agents of the Imperium and Unaligned Units don't count towards breaking this. Rather than having a unique boosted super doctrine that some other chapters have, Death Watch instead get to choose the order of their doctrines, though they can only use Devastator maximum of once, Tactical maximum of twice, and Assault Doctrine maximum of three times. I think if you are packing a fair few heavy weapons, Devastator might still make sense to use turn one, but it does open up a fair amount of other options. You could maybe go straight into Tactical Doctrine turn one and turn two, if you're really trying to make the most out of Rapid Fire and Assault weapons, and that could be particularly quite nice if you have a whole load of guys piling out of drop pods turn one. You could also think about either using Devastator or Tactical on turn 1, and then go straight into Assault Doctrine after that. I don't think that there would usually be much point in having Assault Doctrine right from turn 1, as you're not likely to be in combat. Death Watch have gained a few interesting combat buffs in this update, and you might be able to make a more melee-focused Death Watch army work, although I'm a little bit sceptical as to whether it would really hold up to armies such as Blood Angels and Space Wolves. Overall, I think it's a quite a nice bonus, and it's certainly one that you can build an army around. Though it wouldn't be an absolute deal breaker for me, I would be happy to soup Death Watch with other Space Marine armies if it made sense to to cover some weaknesses. Fairly well balanced, rewarding some pure Death Watch players, without meaning that you'd always want to fill them pure in every single case. Next we have Special Issue Ammunition, which is pretty much the same as the Index. It is now confirmed that they're only on certain pieces of war gear, notably Death Watch bolt guns, combi weapons and stalker bolt guns. Bolt pistols don't have this. Neither do Storm Bolters, Twin Bolt Guns on Bikes, or any of the Bolt Rifle variants on Intercessors. You can use a Stratagem for two command points to make any of these weapons heavy one and fire a Special Issue Ammunition shot, which could potentially be worth it in some circumstances if you're firing a bunch of Stalker Bolt Rifle Intercessors maybe. In any case, when you pick your weapons firing modes, you can either choose Dragonfire Bolts, Hellfire, Kraken or Vengeance as before. They've been switched around a bit, Dragonfire still ignores cover, Hellfire is plus 1 to wound versus non-vehicles and titanics, which is actually a bit weaker than before. Kraken is the same plus 6 inches to range and improve AP by minus 1, and that does work with the combat doctrines. And Vengeance maybe received a bit of a buff, it's gone to plus 1 damage now, so damage 2 standard bolters, and quite nice that you don't lose any range on that. Besides against some unique units, I don't think the Dragonfire is going to be used very much, Kraken will tend to supersede it I think. And Vengeance is likely to be your go-to against anything with two wounds or more, as it will literally double your damage output. In plenty of cases, a standard Death Watch bolt gun with special issue ammunition will outperform a Storm Bolter now, or at least be just as good as one for two points less. Storm Bolters cost you two points on a standard Death Watch veteran squad with special issue ammunition bolters. Next, I thought we'd talk through the various data sheets in the Codex, and then talk a bit about these new kill teams. For the HQ, we have the Watchmaster at 125 points. To be honest, he's largely unchanged. He has the new chapter master wording, so it's not a full reroll aura anymore. You only get the 6-inch aura of reroll once to hit, 
He is a little bit weaker than previously, and it's a shame that as that ability applies in the command phase, we won't be able to use those full read rolls of squads coming out of Deep Strike. Still though, I think he's a pretty solid HQ with a decent save and decent melee weapon, and the Vigil Spear still gets special issue ammunition. Next up, we have Captain Artemis for 110 points. Compared with the previous Codex, his power sword is now plus 1 strength and damage 2, so he's actually a credible threat to most things. He was really, really underwhelming in combat before, I thought. Hellfire Extremis, his combi Flamer still wounds everything non-vehicle and non-titanic on 2s, and the Flamer part has been upgraded to a 12 inch range, which is pretty helpful. Finally, his fun little stasis bomb that gives you the chance of doing d6 mortal wounds if he gets to throw it, is still there. Unfortunately, if he misses now, he doesn't hit himself, so he's not likely to drop it on himself and to freeze himself in time or anything now. Always good to know. I think he's interesting, quite well rounders, and could be a fun upgrade to a captain if you do get to throw that bomb. Next we have Chaplain Cassius, who's 100 points. He's a bit different to his Ultramarines version, as I believe it represents him in an earlier point in history when he was part of the Death Watch. Accordingly, he's only toughness 4 with less bionics, I presume, but he does have 4 attacks and leadership 10 in this version. As I don't believe he's a master of sanctity at this point, he only knows one listening, but he does get a plus 1 cast to recite it, so it is a very reliable one. Other than that, he's not so different from a standard chaplain. He's got an Artificer Crovisius with strength plus 2, AP minus 2, and a special issue ammunition bolt pistol. I think he's probably best used if you just want one very reliable litany, and you don't want to shell out the command points for a Master of Sanctity who can cast two. Next we have Codicia Natorian, who's a new unique librarian, and he's part of the Kill Team Cassius box. He's basically an extra fighty librarian, he's got weapon skill 2+, plus and a force sword with AP-4, and he's basically the same as a standard librarian, except he gets plus 1 to cast smite and other witchfires. 10 points more than a standard librarian. For me, he's a little bit take or leave, to be honest. I'm not really sure it's worth it just for that plus one to cast on Smite, as the Space Marine Witch Fires are a bit weak. Next, we have one of the most important data sheets in the army, which are the veterans. As before, these guys have an incredibly complex data sheet. They're power level 9 now, and each Death Watch veteran is 20 points armed with a Death Watch bolt gun. You can include a Black Shield in addition in the unit. You can have only one of those, and they're 25 points. They have a weapon skill of 2 plus, 3 attacks. And though they no longer allow your unit to heroic intervention for free, you can do it with a stratagem if one of them's about. To me, they seem like a really solid little troops choice. I say they're pretty much flatly better than intercessors, as if you use crack and bolts, then their bolt guns essentially become bolt rifles. They get two attacks just the same as intercessors, and in the circumstances it makes sense to fire something other than crack and bolts, and you can switch to vengeance or hellfire or something. Of course, they're also far, far more flexible. You can tool them up to be very dangerous in close combat, they get discounted power weapons in the same way that Vanguard veterans do. For example, a power fist is 8 points, and you can take a very threatening heavy thunder hammer, which is 15 points, strength times 2, AP minus 3, and flat damage 4. Standard Space Marines really wish they could get this piece of kit, I think. If you want an extra bit of melee punch in the unit, then I'd strongly consider this. I believe that you could take that on the Black Shield or Watch Sergeant as well now, which would be pretty handy for getting 4 attacks out of it with Shock Assault. You can also take standard heavy weapons in heavy flamers, missile launchers and heavy bolters, and the new neat Death Watch versions, the Frag Cannon and the Infernus Heavy Bolter. Infernus Heavy Bolters look really quite decent if you can get both parts in range, only 15 points for a heavy flamer and a heavy bolter all built into one, even if you are minus one to hit with the heavy bolter if you fire both. The Frag Cannon is also 15 points now, though it's been toned down a little bit in terms of its anti-tank power. You've got the choice between two firing modes, the first is 12 inch Assault 2D3, Strength 6, AP-1, Damage 1, and Blast, so a little bit of general purpose anti-infantry there. Or the Shell Mode, which is 24 inches, Assault 2, Strength 7, AP-2, and Damage 2. I wouldn't say either is particularly bad, but it's not quite as fierce and more menacing as it used to be, I think. In terms of other options on the standard veterans, you can of course swap your Death Watch bolt guns for Death Watch shotguns. These still seem like a pretty solid option to me if you are guaranteed to be getting within 12 inch range. If you do, then the Xenoburge slugs are two shots at strength 4, AP-1, and damage 2. And if you can get a bit closer, then the Worm's Breath 1 is 8 inches, and is essentially the profile of a short-range flamer. The Storm Bolters are plus 2 points now, and to me now feel fairly balanced against the Death Watch Bolters. You do pay a bit more, and they will be better in some circumstances, particularly against Hordes. Stalker Bolt Guns are essentially the same as Stalker Bolt Rifles, but with only 30-inch range and the Special Issue Ammunition Rule. I feel like they're just perhaps a little bit underwhelming compared with Stalker Bolt Rifle Intercessors, even though they do get the Special Issue Ammo Rule. Just costing 5 points more, I don't think is going to make them very efficient. The Combi Weapons that you get Special Issue Ammunition on are 10 points, although the Combi Flamer is only 5, 
Again, if you are dropping down within 12 inch strike range, then that could be a really good pickup. With that many threatening shots, you're going to be melting through basically anything. And you have the option to take Storm Shields for 5 points or Combat Shields on the Watch Sergeant. Storm Shields are 5 points on these guys and will make them a lot tankier, though at fairly significant cost. I think they're well balanced to be honest. I could certainly see the argument for taking a full unit of Storm Shields to make them maximally hard to remove, or not bothering with any and just buying more veterans for the points that you save. Overall, I think that veterans are looking solid as a troops unit, so much flexibility, and even if they're just maintaining the battle line instead of intercessors, perhaps with the standard bolt guns and a heavy thunder hammer mixed in, I don't think that you're going to be going too far wrong. Let's talk briefly about some of the other units now. First we have Kill Team Cassius, which is 260 points. These guys are basically a fixed loadout Deathwatch kill team, with 9 models including a Terminator and a Biker, and 2 Vanguard veterans. You can't swap out any of their war gear, they just get given what they're given. It does include a combi melter and a frag cannon mixed within the unit, as well as the Terminator getting an interesting Deathwatch Heavy Flamer, which can choose what sort of rounds it's firing. It basically either wounds on twos with no AP, has 2d6 shots but needs to roll to hit, and has the blast special rule, or fires the standard Heavy Flamer round. Quite a nice fun little touch in my opinion. It's interesting that the biker gets a twin bolt gun with special issue ammo as well, that's not something that the other bikers get, and the squad auto passes morale. Finally, as we'll come on to with the Deathwatch kill team specialisms, this one gets the Aquila specialism, which means it'll reroll ones against two enemy battlefield rolls rather than one. Overall, I'd describe kill team Cassius as okay, though I do suspect you might just be better off designing and optimising your own kill team rather than just going with a slightly random set of loadouts. Next, we have Deathwatch Terminators and Deathwatch Bikes. Terminators are 33 point space and are quite flexible, being able to mix regular Terminators and Assault Terminators the regular Terminators can take power swords and power weapons instead of their power fists. They can also take a plasma cannon if desired, I believe because one of them comes in the Deathwatch Dark Angels kit. I think it's quite a useful loadout to have, just being able to take some very cheap Terminators means that you could have some cheaper tanking wounds in a mixed Proteus kill team with the veterans. The bikers are only 30 points per model, which is quite interesting as they seem to be flatly better than standard Codex Marine bikers, as they're basically the same, they have the same points cost, but they all get two attacks each. These guys are honestly going to be quite vicious in close combat, they can all take Astartes Chainswords, they'll have 3 wounds, some bolt shots in shooting, and 4 chainsword attacks apiece on the charge, and they'll really compete fairly well with Outrider squads even on the charge I think. If you like bikers, then Deathwatch veteran bikers do seem like a very solid option. You can even get objectives secured on them as well, if you take them as part of a Proteus kill team with some veterans, and then combat squad them. Finally, we come to the Corvus Blackstar, a model that has honestly been struggling for quite a while now. It remains at 180 point space, where it went to in 9th, and comes with a twin assault cannon, a cluster launcher, and two rockets at base. The rockets can either be Blackstar rockets, which are now 30 inches, heavy 2d3, strength 5, AP-1, D1, and blast, and you can swap them out for two sets of Stormstrike missiles, which are the strength 8, AP-3, damage 3 ones. Both seem fairly reasonable to me, I guess it just depends whether you want a bit more anti-tank or anti-infantry. The cluster launcher works in the same way as before, the bomb that does the mortal wounds on sixes, and you can also add a hurricane bolter for an extra 15 points, which doesn't seem unreasonable if you are planning on getting close. Its Auspex Array and Infernum Halo launcher have both been tweaked, Auspex Array now just gives Ignore's cover, which to be honest is a pretty reasonable pickup for 5 points on a really big shooty model, I'd be tempted to pick that up. The Halo Launcher is 5 points for plus 1 save when you're attacked by an aircraft. That's honestly a bit niche, and I wouldn't bother. The Corvus has a stratagem that allows it to be untargeted for turn 1, unless it's the closest model, so it could potentially be a bit more useful as a transport, or guarantee yourself an Alpha Strike. When just using it as a gunship though, I think it's still perhaps a little bit underwhelming for its points. You really are paying a bit of a premium to get that massive mobility. Next up we come to the kill teams. We have Proteus, Fortis, Indomitor, or Spectrus. And these are formed by mixing models from different data sheets. They retain most of their special rules, and for the most part, they retain all of their war gear options. They have the troops battlefield role, and in terms of interacting with terrain, provided there's at least one infantry model in the unit, they'll still be counted as infantry, even if there are some bikers in there. The fact that their troops is quite useful, as it means that you can get objectives secured on units like terminators and bikers by making them part of a kill team, and then breaking them off into two different combat squads. And that's pretty important in 9th edition. In terms of the kill teams themselves, the Proteus team starts with 5 veterans, then you can add further veterans, bikers, terminators or vanguards to the units. Though these guys for the most part only just bring their extra war gear and profiles now. You don't get any inbuilt special rules such as fearless for the terminator, although some of them allow certain stratagems to be used as we'll see with the bikers and vanguards. 
If you have a Vanguard vet, then you get a Multibomb keyword for the whole unit, so that can be pretty handy for blowing up enemy vehicles in combat. The 40s kill team starts with 5 intercessors, and you can add more intercessors, assault intercessors, outriders or hellblasters. These guys don't share any special rules, it could be interesting to have some objective secured outriders perhaps. The indomitor kill team is the gravis armoured one, it starts with 5 heavy intercessors, and you can add eradicators, inceptors or aggressors. Eradicators can still use total obliteration, but they do have to fire all at one target, and only they get the benefit. It could be nice to have Eradicators, Inceptors or Aggressors having their wounds tanked for them by Heavy Intercessors as well, as they're really quite durable point for point. Finally we have the Spectrus kill team which starts with 5 Infiltrators, and then you can add in Cursors, Eliminators or Reavers to the unit. Omni Scramblers and Terror Troops will apply to the whole unit, provided there's at least one Infiltrator or Reaver in there, and you can take up to 5 Eliminators in one squad with this, which is quite interesting as you can't in any other way. The main downside for me of this one is that it's tied to taking at least 5 infiltrators, which are just a little bit expensive compared with some of the other Primaris troop variants. Next we have Kill Team Specialisms, where if you have a Death Watch detachment, then you can pay points to have them upgraded to any one of these 6. Each one can only be used once, and Kill Team Cassius gets the Aquila one upgraded for free, and it doesn't stop you from taking another Aquila Kill Team. The Aquila one's a bit different to the others, it allows you to choose two different battlefield roles for the purposes of your Xenos Hunters chapter tactic, and you get reroll wound rolls of one against both of them. It's nice on Kill Team Cassius, but I don't really see it being worth 25 points, you're going to get them against your primary target anyway, and I strongly consider just buying heavier firepower or more veterans if you want the damage boost, that'll work against everything. The other ones also give you reroll wound rolls of one against certain other battlefield roles, but if that battlefield roll is selected for the Xenos Hunters chapter tactic, then you get to reroll all wound rolls against them. Dominatus will do this for elites, Fiora for troops, Malleus for heavy support, Lords of War and dedicated transports, Pagatus for HQs, and Veneta for fast attack and flyers. Most of them cost 25 points, though Fiora and Malleus cost 35, just because I think they're going to be a bit more likely to come up. For me, the main reason to take these would be to try and get the full reroll wound rolls, which is very powerful far more so than re-rolling just wound rolls of one. The strength of them just massively depends on exactly what you're fighting, but I think that the Fiora one could be particularly good against troops, as the vast majority of armies that you'll likely be fighting will bring troops to the field. Maybe you could just load up a squad with storm bolters, auto bolt rifles, or aggressors with auto bolt storm gauntlets, teleport them in with this tactic, and just go to town cleaning up all the enemy troops off the table. You would want to take it on a max size kill team to get the most bang for your buck out of it, as it is quite an expensive upgrade, but I do think in the right circumstances they could be particularly powerful. I think that people aren't going to want to take the ones for the more niche choices. You might face armies that don't have any fast attack or flyers in whatsoever, so the Venator one could be useless against a lot of foes. Although I think that the Pagatus one could be quite interesting against HQs, maybe if you decided to take a bunch of Eliminators in that new Spectrus kill team. Overall, I think that the kill teams are quite powerful, I suspect that we'll see them run quite a lot in the troop slot, although I'm a bit more on the fence about these specialisms being worth the points. Next up we have the Death Watch Stratagems, they've got a very generous 18 in total, and they do have some really quite decent and interesting options in here. There are 6 anti-Xenos ones, Death to the Alien will give you plus 1 attack versus anything with one of the Xenos keywords, not bad for a little bit of souping up combat damage if and when it's needed, and the other 5 of these are against anti-specific Xenos factions. Prognosticating Volley is 1 command points to ignore Ballistic Skill modifiers versus Eldar, lots of Eldar pack Trixie Ballistic Skill manipulation, so I think that this will certainly see use in that matchup. Synaptic Severance has been improved a bit, hit rolls of 6 auto wound Tyranid Synapse creatures, which is a lot better than ignoring Lookout Sir rules, as most of them didn't have it anyway. Could be pretty good if you're targeting them with low strength weapons, in particular if you're firing Vengeance round special issue ammunition, I think that that could be a pretty strong combo. Targeting Scramblers will mess with Tau's Marker Lights, and for one command point you can just remove them all from one of your units. Overkill stops Necrons getting back up quite as easily, after a Death Watch unit has attacked a Necron unit, for 1 command points there'll be minus 1 to reanimation protocols. It's not bad, but you want to have done some hefty damage to actually make sure that that's worth it. And finally, Stem the Green Tide is 2 command points now. It allows your Death Watch unit to fire Overwatch against an Orc unit, and if any die as a result of the attacks, then they're going to be minus 2 inches to their charge. This one in particular is really powerful if Orc units are charging out of Deep Strike. Forcing them to have an 11 inch charge is just really unlikely to succeed, even if they do have rerolls. Overall, all useful, but only usable in one matchup. Now we come to the more generic stratagems, and there's some really good stuff here. Teleportarians, one command point per unit to put them in deep strike. It was a bit more limited in terms of numbers as before, 
you can only deep strike infantry dreadnoughts or bikers, and you can only use it twice in a strike force game, three times in an onslaught, or only once if the game is smaller. It is still possible to outflank some things with strategic reserve though, if you want more death watch coming in from reserve. I think that most death watch armies will still take advantage of this. Next we have a really fun one, which is Brotherhood of Veterans. This is two command points, and it allows you to swap one death watch unit's tactics for your own chapter tactics for the duration of your entire turn. Now this will just give you an absolute ton of options with every single death watch unit that you have on the board, although admittedly you do have to pay 2 CP for the privilege. There's some really nice options with this one. You can get Blood Angels plus 1 to charge and then plus 1 to wound on the charge with an assault unit. It'll certainly let them leave a lot more of a mark. You could use Ultramarines fall back and shoot if you needed. You could use White Scars advance and charge or fall back and charge. Or just pump out an entire ton more bolt shots with Imperial Fists exploding sixes which would work with your special issue ammunition. Two command points means that you're not going to want to use this all the time, but if you can remember the options they have open to you, it really does mean that your Death Watch units could be nightmares, in particular with things like falling back and shooting or falling back and charging, which could really catch your opponent by surprise. Next up we have Adaptive Tactics for 2CP. You need a Watchmaster present on the board, and it allows you to change your Xenos Hunter's chapter tactic to a different battlefield role. Maybe it could be worth it late game if you've killed all the things that have the initial battlefield role. I'm not sure it's going to be used all that much to be honest. Sanction of the Black Vault is one command point to give a sergeant a relic, but it has to be the Artificer Armor, Mastercrafted Weapon, Digital Weapons, Bane Bolts of Eryxia, or the Artificer Bolt Cache. I'm not sure how worth it this one's going to be, maybe putting Mastercrafted Weapon on a Power Fist could be good, or perhaps putting Bane Bolts on a Bolt Sniper Rifle. I think for the most part though it's not going to be particularly worth it compared with upgrading your characters. Next for one command point we have a Vigil Unmatched, this allows you to have an extra Death Watch Warlord trait on your actual Warlord provided that Warlord isn't a named character or anything. This one I think is really really good, as it's one of the Death Watch Warlord traits that allows you to take one of the Codex specific Warlord traits for your Death Watch Warlord. We'll get onto that in a bit, but I think the upshot is that this stratagem is really worth it. Doubling up on Warlord traits is often going to be worth a CP. For 1 CP, Priority Doctrine Adoption is a stratagem that you can use if you have a pure Death Watch army, and it allows you to put one squad in a different Doctrine to the one that you're currently in. You can do this in the Core Codex Space Marines, but it costs you 2 command points and they get all doctrines instead of just one. But I think in a pure Death Watch army that this one could be really useful, particularly say if you have a whole load of units shooting one turn and then one unit's charging, putting them in the Assault Doctrine for that phase could be really useful. Next we have Shroud Field, which is 2 command points. This one's the one for the Corvus Black Star, and it means that it can't be shot unless it's closest on your first battle round. It will basically guarantee it's a turn of survival unless your opponent can jump all the way over to your side of the board turn 1, but it does mean that you're putting quite a lot of investment in that Corvus just to make it work. We then have Clavis for one command point. This one is the Watchmaster in close combat. You use it at the start of the fight phase, and if he's in combat with a vehicle, it takes D3 mortal wounds, and that vehicle must fight last. Not bad, and particularly good if the vehicle was going to fight first, and potentially try and squash your Watchmaster before he gets to attack. Next up we have a few stratagems that I think will be used on kill teams and veterans the most. Disruptive Launch is used on any Death Watch jump pack unit, and it allows a unit to fall back and shoot if there's a jump pack model in it. This one's honestly really powerful for 1 CP, and it might still mean that you want to put Vanguard veterans on your Proteus kill teams, or perhaps an Inceptor in the Gravis Armoured one. A really good get out of jail free this one, it's also pretty awesome on just standard Inceptor units. Say if you take a bunch of Plasma Inceptors, they drop down and kill something, then get charged, you can fall back and blast away happily, they don't even get a minus one to hit penalty or anything. Relentless Assault allows you to do similar with a bike, for one command point your kill team can fall back and charge if there's a bike model in it, and again that also applies to other regular veteran bikers and things, which I think between this, extra attacks and obsec, will probably see a fair amount of play. There's also a two command point one called Special Issue Loadout, this basically gives you the option to fire a Special Issue Ammo round with any bolter armed unit, Bolt weapons that aren't bolt sniper rifles gain special issue ammunition, but they change their type to heavy one for that attack. In all honesty, at two command points, I think that this one's overcosted. At best, it's only really going to be used on stalker bolt rifle intercessors, that sort of thing, things that are already heavy one. But I'm just not sure that the two command points is really going to be worth it for the extra damage that you get in the vast majority of cases. Maybe in a fairly niche scenario, like you've got a full squad of 10 Stalker Bolt Rifles, and they're all firing against 3 wound models, so you want them to be flat damage 3. One thing that they seem to have missed with this, is that this also affects pistols currently, so it would allow you to also fire your pistols as heavy 1 special issue ammunition weapons, at the same time as your main gun. I'm pretty certain that that'll get FAQs, as I don't think it's intentional, 
but until then, most Space Marines have bolt pistols, and you'll be able to fire an extra special issue round at 12 inch range with one of those on top of your main gun, as they'll lose the pistol special rule. Finally, we have Atonement through Honor, that's one command point, and it allows a unit with a black shield to heroically intervene as if it were a character. A pretty useful reason to have one in the unit as well, makes veterans extra good for securing objectives and not having them stolen out from underneath them. Overall, plenty of good stratagems here. I think the Brotherhood of Veterans will be an important one to remember, and really remember the options that every unit has access to every single turn. I think a Vigil on Match will be used in most games for the extra Warlord trait, and Disruptive Launch and Relentless Assault are both pretty decent abilities for just one command point for a kill team. Let's move on to the Relics of the Watch Fortresses then. And again, we have a very generous amount of these, with plenty of new ones being added for this codex. We've got the standard Adamantine Mantle, Mastercrafted Weapon, Digital Weapons and Artificer Armor. Mastercrafted Weapon in particular being a pretty useful one on any fighty characters. The Beacon Angelus is just as good as it was before. This is one of the really useful relics that allows a Death Watch Infantry or Barker unit to teleport within 6 inches of the bearer, so it could mean that you get a lot of Death Watch very quickly up the field turn 1, if you combine it with something like a Jump Pack character, or maybe a Phobos Armored one sitting in the midfield. I definitely think that this is still worth taking, being able to deploy an entire squad very quickly, and it's also been buffed slightly, as you can now take a squad out of strategic reserves to deploy in the same way. I'm sure that that one will still see use. I'm not going to lie, my favourite relic though is the Dominus Aegis. This one will make your Death Watch battle line incredibly tanky, and it's taken on any model with a Storm Shield or Combat Shield. It replaces this war gear, and as far as I can tell, I think you do lose any 4 plus inball saves that you get from the Storm Shield, but it more than makes up for it, because any core or character unit within 6 inches of the bearer get a 5 plus invul save. This one's pretty nuts, as for just one relic, you could potentially cover a lot of your army with this. You could have multiple 2 wound kill teams with a 3 plus armor and 5 plus invul, and then maybe stack that with something like an apothecary for some feel no pain as well. It could also work on dreadnoughts as well, the redemptor dreadnought looking like a really good option for this. I can imagine that stomping up the field with a 5 plus invul, and also their new duty eternal is going to be a real pain to shift. The best part of this is that you don't need to remain stationary as you needed to before for this, and frankly I expect to see this one appear in most Death Watch armies. It's a really good durability buff. Next we have the Osseus Key, which makes enemy vehicles minus 1 to hit and minus 1 attacks when you're within 12 inches. A bit specific this one, you really do need to be facing against vehicles for it to count for much, and the enemy might still be able to just move away with said vehicles. The Thief of Secrets is a Relic Power Sword, with Strength plus 1, AP minus 4 and Damage 1. It ignores invuls and it's damage 2 versus Xenos. You can also upgrade a Xenophase Blade for this one. I don't think it's all that strong. The Tome of Ectoclades will give you a powerful one turn shooting buff. It allows core units within 6 inches to reroll all wound rolls against one selected data sheet for the enemy. So, say if the enemy had lots of intercessors, you could choose intercessors and then they get 4 rerolls for that turn. Could be good to have a character start on the board, maybe have a couple of squads deep strike down onto them, and then go to town on whatever enemy datasheet happens to be closest. Could be really nice in combination with a whole load of special issue ammunition bolt fire. Next we have the Black Weave Shroud, which is plus 1 toughness and a 4 plus feel no pain against mortal wounds, not the strongest. Spear of the First Vigil, which is a relic vigil spear for the Watchmaster, compared with the standard is Rapid Fire 2 compared with Rapid Fire 1, and Flat Damage 3 and Strength 6. Pretty good if your Watchmaster is thinking about getting mixed up in close combat, he'll be shootier and he'll be fightier. Soul Fortress is a fairly underwhelming Librarian upgrade, it allows you to ignore modifiers to cast, and his Psychic Hood ability goes to 24 inches to allow a little bit easier dispelling. Honestly, I don't think it's worth it myself. The Bane Bolts of Eryxia give you a very powerful single shot bolt weapon, it goes to Strength 6, AP-2 and Damage 3. I guess it could be okay on a captain that's sitting around buffing other units and isn't going to be getting it mixed up in melee to give him a bit more shooting threat. The Rokram Pattern Auspicator gives core units within 6 inches plus 1 to hit against Fly, a pretty decent buff but only relevant against certain battlefield roles, so I don't think it'll be taken all that much. The Artificer Bolt Cache gains special issue ammunition on a bolt weapon, ideally you'd want this on something with the maximum amount of shots. Maybe it could be interesting on an Aggressor Sergeant or Centurion Sergeant with a Hurricane Bolter, which I think could be okay perhaps to give everything damage to. And there's the Eye of Abiding, which ignores all modifiers to hit and wound, and Sixes to wound also ignore enemy invul saves. Perhaps a bit random as a buff, might be good if you're combining that with a Power Fist or Thunder Hammer, which I believe would allow you to hit on your normal weapon skill. If so, not really all that bad on something like a Fighty Smash Captain. Overall though, my favourite relic is the Dominus Aegis by quite a long way, and the Beacon Angelus and Tome of Ectoclades, both of which provide some pretty decent buffs. 
Next we have the shiny new Xena Purge Discipline. It has 6 spells. Primorphic Resonance for Warp Charge 6 is a blessing that gives any Death Watch unit within 18 inches, Overwatch on 5+, plus, fights first, and plus 1 to hit in melee. I'd say the plus 1 to hit in melee is actually really quite good, and could be great to stack on some sort of fighty Death Watch veteran unit that's jumping forward to attack the enemy. Could be very good on something like Terminators or Aggressors who have a natural minus 1 to hit. Fortified with Contempt is one of the best ones on the discipline. Warp Charge 6, and any infantry or biker unit within 18 inches gets a 5 plus feel no pain. That one's going to be nasty on a full 10 man death watch kill team when combined with the Dominus Aegis. 5 plus invul save and 5 plus feel no pain makes for Space Marines that are going to stick around. Neural Void is Warp Charge 7, a malediction that gives minus 1 attack to an enemy unit and it can only declare charges on the closest unit. This could be potentially very useful if you'd managed to get it on a big enemy assault death star but I'm just not sure I'd take this power in the first place, as not every enemy army has one of those. Psychic Cleanse is a Warp Charge 6 Witchfire. Every enemy model within 9 inches will suffer a mortal wound on the roll of a 6. You really have to get close for this one, and even then it's not going to be all that great unless you're against a massive horde. I'd probably just use Smite instead and forgo this. Mantle of Shadow is a Warp Charge 6 Blessing that targets a Death Watch Infantry unit, and if said Death Watch Infantry unit doesn't either shoot or charge in your turn, then the enemy can't target it with shooting attacks unless they're either within 12 inches or they're the closest models to them. This one could be very nice for hiding an enemy unit that's wanting to do an action or just survive one extra turn, potentially a good one to mess with your opponent's target priorities. Finally we have an anti-character one called Severance, it's warp charge 7 and you target an enemy character within 18 inches, they take one mortal wound, the unit's aura is decreased by 3 inches in range, and if the psychic test casting value happens to be greater than the enemy leadership, then they can't use auras at all. I guess the dream would be getting the last result on Rebute Gilliman or something like that. In any case, it's quite a powerful debuff. Overall, for me, the pick of the discipline is fortified with contempt for that feel no pain, with Promorphic Resonance being very reliably good if you have an assault unit to use it on, and Mantle of Shadow or Severance being situationally useful. Next we have Warlord Traits. Artemis has a Vigilance Incarnate, which allows you to select a battlefield roll in the command phase, and Deathwatch core units within 6 inches re-roll wound rolls of 1 against that battlefield roll. Could sort of make your character a pseudo-lieutenant, as you can tailor those re-rolls to what they'll actually be attacking. Not bad if a character's thinking about buffing a gunline. Paragon of their chapter is in my opinion probably the best. This one allows you to choose one of the Codex-specific Warlord traits from Codex Space Marines, so say the Blood Angels or Ultramarines one, and there's some really fun little options in these. Beast Slayer from Space Wolves can make your character an absolute tank when killing vehicles or monsters. Dark Angels can further manipulate combat doctrines, and Ultramarines can farm command points. I think honestly there will be something that will fit in with your strategy out of these, and I'd say that this one's really going to be a go-to. For some reason Games Workshop did make a special rule which means that if the heraldry from the chapter is painted on your model, then you have to use that chapter, which I think is a little bit annoying as it's dictating how you paint your models. Nowhere to Hide allows you to select one enemy unit, and Death Watch core units within 6 inches will ignore light cover against them. Codicia Notorian has this one. I'd say it's okay, it's not always going to be helpful against every army though. Optimized Priority is one that Cassius has. It means that Death Watch core and character units within 6 inches can shoot while doing actions. I wouldn't bother with this one personally. Castellan of the Black Vault is really quite fun. It allows you to take an additional relic on your warboard, which can be either the Adamantine Mantle, Artifice Armor, Mastercrafted Weapon, or Digital Weapons, and you get this in addition to any other relics that the character has. Could be fun to combine a Mastercrafted Weapon with some other buffing relic perhaps, maybe the Dominus Aegis. Finally, we have the Ties That Bind. This one's a 6 inch aura of reroll morale tests for core units, and in the command phase it allows you to hand out Obsec to one core unit within 6 inches. I'd say the Obsec is actually the better of these two abilities out of this, and could be an interesting alternative to the Codex Space Marine one that allows you to do similar. For me, my favourite is Paragon of the Chapter, followed closely by Castellan of the Black Vault, and Nowhere to Hide and Vigilance Incarnate are also interesting. Finally, Death Watch have four unique secondaries, which gives you quite a lot of options when you're picking them from Codex Space Marines as well. The Long Vigil gives you five victory points, provided you manage to keep enemy units away from the six inches of your deployment zone. Very easy to counter for your opponents, and you can't score it in the first battle round, unless your opponent has no units they want to be putting towards your lines, then I really wouldn't be using this one. Call Order is a Purge the Enemy one, where you choose one battlefield roll and your opponent chooses two of them. If all units from said roll have been destroyed by the end of the game, you score 5 victory points per roll. Again, quite an easy to counter one, your opponent could try and hide just one unit out of each of those rolls, and they might deny you a lot of victory points that way. 
Again, probably not my favourite. Cripple Stronghold is a really hard to achieve one, where your opponent nominates one of their objectives, ideally in their deployment zone. Then you have to both reach that stronghold and also perform an action multiple times with it, and you get 6 victory points per action. If your opponent can't even hold on to one objective, you're probably winning anyway. Finally, Suffer Not the Aliens Live is good, but maybe a bit unbalanced. You get 1 victory point per Xenos unit killed by a Death Watch unit, and it's pretty much an auto pick if you're facing against something like Tau or Tyranids with loads and loads of small units. Not the most balanced one ever, and I could imagine it could be quite frustrating for your opponent if there's basically no way that they can avoid giving up this secondary. So overall, really quite a fun update for Death Watch, and I think that this is going to give them a new lease of life on the table. Quite a lot of nice options to give them a Special Forces vibe. It is a bit of a shame losing Special Issue ammo on quite so many options, and honestly I'm not sure whether this update is going to make them stronger than they were previously, though I think it gives them far more flexibility in terms of what options they might take. In terms of the strongest things in the books, I think that the kill teams will be taken a lot, both to get obsec troops and some nice flexible squads. Mission Tactics is really useful for Combat Doctrine manipulation. Some of the stratagems can be really helpful for allowing your units to do tricky things such as fall back and shoot or charge, and also grab other random chaps tactics from other chapters. I think the Dominus Aegis and Beacon Angelus will make a lot of appearances in Death Watch lists, and they've got some solid Warlord traits such as Paragon of the Chapter, Castellan of the Black Vault, and that lovely Fortified with Contempt Feel No Pain Psychic Power. I'm really interested to see what sort of lists people come up with with the Death Watch for this. I think the thing that most excites me is big units of Death Watch with lots of special issue ammunition bolters, maybe with a heavy thunder hammer or two thrown in. It'd be quite nice to see if anyone manages to make a sort of close combat style Death Watch army work, which I think is far more viable. So let me know your thoughts on the Codex, and what sort of things occur to you after the first read. Feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics if you'd like to see more videos like this. Hopefully we'll have the Space Wolf Codex in review it's not so very far in the future. And if you have enjoyed the video, then I'd just like to mention that the channel has a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description. These videos take quite a long time to make, so any support is massively appreciated if you are enjoying regularly. Channel patrons get certain advantages, such as seeing videos early, regular votes on what sort of things come next on the channel, and also entry to the regular Auspex Tactics prize giveaway. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.